This video is part two of a lesson on the derivative or the derivative function in calculus. And we're going to start out by actually deriving a derivative. But first, I want to talk about the verb derive. It's a transitive verb. You derive something. The object of the verb is derivative. Now, we don't usually say we're going to derive a derivative because it sounds kind of repetitive. We could use a different verb instead. We could find a derivative, compute a derivative, calculate a derivative, discover a derivative, reveal a derivative, but all of those verbs are transitive verbs and they all have for their object derivative. An analogous situation would be a chef who says, I will now derive egg salad from these eggs. Derive is a transitive verb and the object is egg salad, or instead he could say I will create egg salad or I will concoct egg salad or I will produce egg salad. But what is he doing to the eggs? If he wanted to say it the other way, he would say, to derive the egg salad, I will boil, peel, and mash the eggs. Now, boil, peel, and mash are transitive verbs whose object is the eggs. But we would never say something like, derive the eggs into egg salad. That is an absurd statement, because the object of the verb derive is not the eggs. It's the egg salad. So don't make the same mistake in calculus. If you want to say, to find the derivative, we will something a function, the verb that goes in that blank is differentiate. You do not derive a function into its derivative. You differentiate a function to derive the derivative. Now, the first example that I'm going to use for finding a derivative is going to make use of the circle. The circle consists of two functions. There's the upper half of the circle, which is y equals square root of 1 minus x squared, and the lower half is y equals negative square root of 1 minus x squared. But let's ignore the lower half for now. Just looking at the upper half function, I'm going to find the slope of the tangent line at one point, and that point is a comma square root of 1 minus a squared, where a is a particular value of x. In order to find the slope of the tangent line, I'm going to use a property of circles that the tangent line is perpendicular to the radius at any point. So I just have to find the slope of the radius, and that amounts to finding the rise over run between two points, the origin and a comma square root of 1 minus a squared. So the rise over run would be square root of 1 minus a squared over a, and that's the slope of the radius line, and therefore the slope of the tangent line is the negative reciprocal of that. And as long as we know the slope of the tangent line at any x value a, we know the derivative of f of x equals square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative was found by replacing the a with an x. The derivative is negative x over square root of 1 minus x squared. It can be that easy to find the derivative, but hold on, this guy says that's cheating. I used a fact from geometry, why would that be cheating? Everything I did was correct analysis, so I don't think it's cheating. It only works for semicircles. Ah, your point is that this method I used doesn't work for general functions. I see, you're right, it was cheating. So what I really need to do is, instead of using geometry, use the standard algebraic method. And that's what I'll do next. We'll take the same function and differentiate it using the standard algebraic method. So let's go over the overview of the lesson. In part one, we reviewed differentiation. We differentiated an entire function and showed that that's what the derivative function is. And now we're starting part two. I'm going to start with algebraic examples of finding the derivative. So we're going to find the derivative of this semicircle function using the standard method this time instead of cheating. So, once again, we'll start out by looking for the derivative at the point a comma square root of 1 minus a squared, but this time we'll do it by finding the slope of the secant line between the point at x equals a and the point at x equals c. And then we'll take the limit of the difference quotient, where the difference quotient is the slope of that secant line, the line through the green point and the red point then putting the y-coordinates and the x-coordinates for those two points into this expression for the difference quotient, we actually get a limit. And this limit constitutes differentiating at a point. It's dy over dx evaluated where x equals a. And it's the limit as c approaches a of square root of 1 minus c squared minus square root of 1 minus a squared over c minus a. That is the slope of the tangent line at that point, 
And as you saw in the other example, in order to find the derivative, we're going to replace a in this expression with x. So the derivative dy over dx equals f prime of x is the limit as c approaches x of square root of 1 minus c squared minus square root of 1 minus x squared over c minus x. So I'll go ahead and calculate this limit and I'll show you all the algebraic steps. Before I do that, it's worth mentioning that some people feel that there was no sense in using a at all. We could have just called that x. But there's a subtle error in doing that because this is the x-axis. And if I label this x, it would be like saying x represents a particular value of x. And that would be using x to mean two different things in the same sentence. So it's a subtle point, but I'm always going to call it a first. And then I'm going to replace the a with x to turn it into a derivative function. So let's go ahead and talk about this limit. How do we evaluate the limit as c approaches x of this expression? Well, first of all, this is a 0 over 0 form limit. And it has to be a 0 over 0 form limit because, remember, it's a difference quotient between two points that are merging into one point. So delta y is on the top and delta x is on the bottom. And whenever you're computing a derivative, you're going to have a 0 over 0 form limit. Remember that when you have a 0 over 0 form with a difference of radicals, as we have here, the approach is to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate. And when you distribute that conjugate over the numerator, you end up with a difference of squares. And I'm not going to distribute it over the denominator because that's not helpful. Then there's some cancellation and we end up with an expression involving c squared minus x squared in the numerator. This c squared minus x squared contains a factor of c minus x. So the next thing I'll do is factor it. I'll separate out the factors so that my 0 over 0 problem is in the front. I know that that factor goes to 1, and now that I've gotten rid of my 0 over 0 problem, all I have to do is replace c with x, because c is approaching x. I replace all the c's with x's, and I see that my derivative is equal to, when I simplify, negative x over square root of 1 minus x squared. So if f of x is square root of 1 minus x squared, then f prime of x equals negative x over square root of 1 minus x squared. And that is the same result that I got by using the geometry trick. So I've shown my algebraic example. Let's see where we are. We reviewed differentiation. We differentiate an entire function. Uh-oh, it doesn't say algebraic example. There's an s there, example. So I need to show another example. So let's use the function g of x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared. I'll compute g prime of x by setting up the difference quotient the same way. Let me draw a sketch, and I'm going to write a difference quotient that is the slope between those two points. And then I'll replace a with x the way I did last time. So g prime of x is the limit as c approaches x of g of c minus g of x divided by c minus x. And if I substitute in the actual function, it's the limit as c approaches x of 1 over 1 plus c squared minus 1 over 1 plus x squared divided by c minus x. Again, this is a 0 over 0 form limit, but in the numerator we have fractions. So we have a complex fractions with two fractions inside the numerator of our fraction. First thing to do in this case is to clear fractions. So I'm going to multiply by the denominators inside the numerator. And then when I distribute that over the numerator, I will clear out the fractions. And I'm not going to distribute it over the denominator because that's not helpful. Next, these ones cancel out, and we have a c squared minus x squared, which has a factor of c minus x in it. And when I separate out the factors that cause the 0 over 0 problem, and I see that that goes to 1, I can substitute in x for c, and I get that g prime of x is equal to negative x plus x over 1 plus x squared times 1 plus x squared, which simplifies to negative 2x over 1 plus x squared squared. In the first video, you were challenged to sketch the derivative of g of x. You can now graph the function g prime that was found here and compare the graph with your sketch. Okay, so back to our outline. We reviewed differentiation. We differentiated an entire function. We saw two algebraic examples. Now it's time to show you that there are two commonly used algebraic forms for the definition of the derivative. I've only shown you one so far. We've used the diagram on the left. This is the one that we were using. Uh, to set up the difference quotient limit. 
Uh, and when we do that, we get f prime of x is the limit as c approaches x of f of c minus f of x over c minus x. That's what you saw in the two preceding examples. But what's more often used when we're deriving the algebraic rules for derivatives is a use of the dummy variable h instead of c. So the, the relationship is just that a plus h is the same as c, or h is the difference, c minus a. It's just a variable substitution, and the definition of the derivative would be written f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. The statement on the right looks a little more complicated, but it's preferred because when you're canceling out the 0 over 0 problem, instead of having to factor out c minus x, you're just canceling factors of h. So what you ought to do is stop the video and try the two preceding examples using this form of the limit instead of this form. See if you can do it on your own. And just in case you want to see the answer so you can check your work or get yourself unstuck if you got stuck, I'll flash the answers on the screen. You could always come back to the video and pause the video and look at the first one or the second one to see the steps as I did them. All right, so we reviewed differentiation. We differentiated an entire function. We saw algebraic examples, and we saw the two algebraic forms. The last part of the lesson is terminology and notation. We start out with the equation y equals f of x. Suppose we want to find the derivative of both sides of that equation. We might write dy over dx equals f prime of x. The first point I want to make is about the prime symbol. The prime symbol looks like that. It's not the same thing as an apostrophe. Some people accidentally start using apostrophes instead of the prime symbol, and I think that might be because Microsoft Word automatically changes primes into apostrophes. If you press the prime key on your keyboard and then immediately press Control z to undo it, it'll turn back from an apostrophe into a prime. Right, the second point I want to make is sometimes y is used as a graphing variable. For example, if you want to graph two functions on the same graph, you could say the black graph is y equals f of x and the red graph is y equals f prime of x. Notice that these two equations seem to contradict each other because they say y is two different things at the same time. But y is being used as the graphing variable, and, and that's just a way of writing two different relations that are simultaneously being graphed. However, sometimes y is actually used as the name of a function. For example, someone could say if y equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, and then compute y of 0, compute y of negative 1, compute y of 1. So since y can also be the name of a function, we're allowed to attach prime to it and make it the name of a derivative function. And we could say dy over dx equals y prime. Next point I want to make is that dy over dx could also be written as d over dx of y. It looks just like fraction multiplication, but this quantity in front of the y is d over dx. Sometimes that's pronounced d by dx because it's a d divided by dx. That is an operator. It's a symbol that means find the derivative of what follows. d by dx of y is the same as dy over dx. It's the same as d by dx of f of x, or df of x over dx, which is the same as f prime. You don't need to write the argument of the function all the time. You could also say something like f prime of x equals d by dx of f of x. And that's fine, because remember, the name of the derivative of f is f prime. But here is something you are not allowed to do. You're not allowed to use the prime symbol as an operator, saying f of x quantity primed is equal to the derivative of f of x. That's an improper usage of the prime symbol. In other words, the prime symbol is part of the name that was given to the derivative function. The prime symbol is not an operator that says take the derivative of the preceding expression. And if you use it this way, then you are misusing it. I will point out that I have seen it misused this way even in textbooks but don't follow their example. That's a misuse of the prime symbol. So let's look at some examples to illustrate this notation, and our friend will tell us whether each one is correct or incorrect. The first example is d by dx of 1 over 1 plus x squared equals negative 2x over 1 plus x squared quantity squared. And the answer is, it's right. 
Second example, 1 over 1 plus x squared quantity prime equals negative 2x over 1 plus x squared squared, and the answer is it's wrong. You cannot use the prime symbol as an operator. We have an operator. It's d over dx, or d by dx. Don't use the prime symbol as an operator. Next example, d by dx of f of 2 is equal to f prime of 2, and the answer is wrong. That's wrong, because d by dx is an operator that says differentiate the following. The following thing, in this case, f of 2, is just a number. It's the number you get when you evaluate the function f at 2. And if you drew a graph of y equals f of 2, that graph would be a horizontal line with slope 0. So actually, d by dx of f of 2 equals 0. All right. The last example is d by dx of f of x evaluated where x equals 2 is equal to f prime of 2. And the answer is right. That would be a correct way of writing that statement. So those four examples illustrate the ideas of the notation. So we've reviewed differentiation, we've differentiated an entire function, we discussed algebraic examples, we discussed the two algebraic forms, and we discussed terminology and notation. And we are finished. No, we're not finished. Why aren't we finished? What do we still have to do? Oh yes, practice problems. Okay, so here are some practice problems for you to try. First, compute dx squared over dx. Two, if f of x equals x cubed plus x, then compute f prime of 3. And number 3, if y equals 1 over x, then show that y prime plus y squared equals 0 everywhere, meaning for every value of x. And the last practice problem, if f of x equals x squared, then show that f prime of 3x equals 1 third times d by dx of f of 3x. Have fun!